are you chasing society's definition of success? Why are you chasing those things? Time and time again, if we chase the wrong dreams, we find that they won't make us happy. The late hours when you're lying in bed, have you defined what success is to you? I think what money does do is remove common sources of unhappiness. But I don't think that's happiness in and of itself. You're not actually directly working on happiness. You're working on alignment. You're working on contentment. You're working on control. These are much more tangible things, I think, for people to really focus on. And the side effect is that you're going to be happier more often. I finished off my training in Edinburgh. I was working there for a couple of years as a junior doctor. And, you know, dad was getting worse and worse. So mum and my brother were struggling to look after him. I decided to move back to the town where I grew up to help my brother and my mum look after dads. And, you know, I still live here now because, you know, by the time dad died, uh, I was settled. I was married. My kids were at school. And, you know, it's a nice place to live, you know. So I'm, I actually live in the place where I grew up, which in many ways, you know, I'm interested as what, how that sounds to you, because you live, I, I think, like quite a nomadic lifestyle. You're, you travel light, you're moving, and maybe we can explore that later because I'm really interested as to the contrast there. But dad died just over nine years ago, and that was a big hole in my life. And I know for, for, for many people, for most people, you know, when one of their parents die, that's a huge moment, right? But it wasn't just an emotional hole that I had in my soul. There was also a daily physical hole because I'd see my dad three times a day. You know, um, in the final years, dad was, you know, I, I would go around at five in the morning. I'd, I'd get dad shaved. I'd get him showered. I'd then come back to my house, try and see my wife and my um, my, you know, my, my little baby boy at the time, then go off to work as a doctor. I, you know, the same after work, it was, it was full on basically. And so suddenly I had all this time, I had all this time after dad died to think, and I would just go for long walks and I would just be thinking about, you know, dad not being here, what that means. And those big, deep existential questions started to come up for me, you know, what am I doing? Is this my life? Is it someone else's life? You know, what am I doing with my life? All these kind of things, which I honestly don't think I'd ever asked myself before. I just got on with life. I did what I thought I had to do. Um, so I think that in a huge way has led to a lot of the realizations that I've had about what it means to live a healthy, a happy and meaningful life. The stuff that I share with my patients, the stuff that I've written about in my brand new book, um, but I just want to finish off what I said about dad working hard, right? Dad came to the UK in 1962. At the time, the British government knew there was a big shortage of doctors in this country. So they were recruiting doctors from countries like India. Dad came here with nothing, like many, like many people. I'm not saying this is anything unique or anything special, but that was dad's story. And he would work hard. In his chosen field, the speciality he loved there was a lot of discrimination. And he realized after a while that actually he was never going to progress in that field. It's like um, he was an obstetrics and gyne surgeon. I've heard since dad died that my dad was a brilliant surgeon. I didn't know that while dad was alive, right? I didn't really know that dad never complained about anything. He just got on with it. But he realized, he told me pretty much on his deathbed that he said, hey son, listen, I would train the local doctors, teach them how to do operations. and two or three years later, they'd be jumping me and getting the promotions. And I kept doing this year after year. And I, I, I soon realized, oh, I get it in this speciality. I'm never going to advance. So he moved to a speciality he frankly doesn't like at all. He didn't like, but he did it for stability, for his family, for secure pay and all that kind of stuff. And, and I respect dad for doing that. But what my dad did was this, right? He worked as a consultant in Manchester World Infirmary, and he would come home from work at about 5.30 or 6 p.m. in the evening. And then he'd go in the kitchen. My mom would give him dinner. Then he'd go upstairs. He would shave. He'd come downstairs and a car would pick him up at 7 p.m. He'd go out in that car. All night, he would be doing GP house calls, maybe 50, 55 house calls during the night, all around Manchester. He'd arrive back at home at 7 a.m. He'd, again, he'd come in, have breakfast, go upstairs and shave, then drive 40 minutes into Manchester 
and do his day job. So he did this for 30 years. So my dad only slept for three nights a week for 30 years. Four nights, he was out working in a car. This is why there is no doubt in my mind, Light, this is why at the age of 57, 58, my dad got sick. Chronic sleep deprivation, chronic stress leads to him getting the autoimmune disease lupus. Dad's work killed him, right? I know that. And that then influenced my mom's life, uh, my adult life, my brother's adult life. And I don't harbor any resentment against my dad. I love my dad, right? I'm glad I cared for him so much, especially now that he's not here. You know, I know there's nothing more I could have done, right? I got to spend so much time with him in his final years. And I cherish that because he's not here anymore. But the point is, is that my dad, he made the mistake, I think, and he had reasons for this, right? I don't know what it's like to leave my friends and my family move halfway across the world to a different country with a different culture and a different language and start a new life. I don't know what that feels like, right? But on the outside, things look great. You know, dad's a consultant. Uh, we go on a nice holiday every summer. My brother and I have a nice education. I never see my dad, right? Dad's not around, dad's working. And he made, the, he made this big mistake that many of us make, which is he confused success with happiness. Dad got success, but he wasn't happy. And I see that playing out. I've seen it play out in my own life lights. I've seen it play out in my patients' lives. And what's really interesting for me is that we talk about chronic stress. You know, you know a few years ago, I, I wrote a book all about stress. Um, we talk about things that we can do to help manage things like breath work and journaling and exercise. And man, I write about that. I talk about that. I'm a fan of that. But I often think like, you know, why are so many of us stressed out and burnt out? I think it's because we are confusing success with happiness. We're chasing things that we think are going to make us happy. We think the better job, the promotion, the nicer hotel on holiday, uh, the nicer phone, uh, the better car, whatever it might be. Many of us think that those things are going to make us happy. And we stress out, we burn out, we neglect the things that truly are going to make us happy in the process. And that's why we need all these stress management techniques. So I, what I want to do, and this is what chapter one in the book is about, is to ask people those questions and help them with simple exercises to say, hey, look, what are you chasing in life? Why are you chasing those things? Have you defined what success is to you? Or are you chasing society's definition of success? Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. So talk about core happiness. Like what, do you, what do you mean by core happiness as opposed to any other kind of happiness? Yeah, I think happiness is a confusing term, right? And what I mean by that is you could say the word happiness to 10 different people. And I think you may well get 10 different interpretations of what happiness really means. Uh, I think one of the things that people think happiness is, is what we get sold by the world around us. You know, that billboard image of that uh, smiling couple uh, on a beach with their kids and the ocean behind them. And we think that's what happiness is. And I don't think that's what real, true happiness is. I think that's a pleasurable experience. It can form part of a happy life. But I don't think that's happiness in and of itself. And I do believe that every human being wants what I call core happiness, right? But I think the, the term happiness gets confused. So core happiness is this model I created for the new book to really try and help people understand that happiness is a muscle that you can strengthen. It's a skill that you can develop. It's not something you have to just stumble across one day when the world around you is a certain way, when uh, people around you treat you a certain way, you know, happiness is something you can train, you can get good at if you know what to work on. So core happiness, I want people to think of as a three-legged stool. Each of these three legs is separate, but they are essential. And if any of these legs starts to weaken, 
your feelings of happiness will also start to weaken and ultimately collapse. So the three legs of this core happiness stool are the three components of happiness, and they are alignment, contentment, and control. So alignment is essentially when the person who you are inside and the person who you want to be out there in the world, the person you are being out there in the world are one and the same. So when your inner values and your external actions start to match up more and more, that is when you are living more aligned. That's one leg of the stool. The second leg is contentment. Contentment is what are those things that you do in life? What are those experiences that make you feel calm, at peace? You know, when are you at peace with your life and your decisions? That's what I'm talking about when I say contentment. And the third leg is control. Now, I thought long and hard about the word control because, again, like happiness, I think the word control can be misinterpreted. Um, and I really wrestled with this light, but I did go for control in the end because I found that most of my patients, most of uh, the people I spoke to about it, kind of got what I meant straight away by it. So when I say control, I am not talking about controlling the world and controlling external events because you know, the last two years, I think, have taught us all that, that the world is uncontrollable. Even if we want the world to go a certain way, the world will do what the world does, right? So when I say control, I mean a sense of control. What are the things that you can do regularly, uh, on a daily basis, perhaps, that give you a sense of control over your life? Because we know, you know, I know from uh, clinical experience, but also from the research that people who have a strong sense of control over their lives, they have higher motivation, they have higher levels of academic success, they have higher social maturity, they are healthier, they're happier. And conversely, people who lack a sense of control over their lives have very high levels of psychological stress. And so these are the three legs of the core happiness stool. And what I, what I really wanted with this model is for people to understand that actually happiness is something you can work on. So we understand that if you go to the gym every day and do bicep curls, we know that we're going to get stronger biceps. And I wanted to create a simple model that also gives people the idea that, oh, if I want to become happier, um, I need to work on these legs of the stool, right? So everything in the book is completely free, right? These are just ideas, simple exercises that people can do that work on alignment, that work on contentment, that work on control. And as you strengthen each one of those legs on the stool, the side effect is going to be that you feel happier more often. So you're not actually directly working on happiness. You're working on alignment. You're working on contentment. You're working on control. These are much more tangible things, I think, for people to really focus on. And the side effect is that you're going to be happier more often. So that's kind of the rough model. And throughout the book, there's all kinds of ideas and exercises that work on different legs of the stool. And, you know, the feedback I've got to say like so far has been absolutely incredible in the UK. I've never had a book launch like this. It seems to really be landing with people, really helping people reflect on their lives. And I'm incredibly passionate about it. And I think I, I, I really think this model, I haven't found a situation yet where this model doesn't hold true, right? I spent a long time trying to create a model that I felt would hold true in every situation that people could put in their back pocket, take it out with them in their life and go, oh, I see. That's why this is helping me. This is why I feel good after that. Oh, this is why when I do that, I don't feel so good. Like, I don't know, I had a patient once who, you know, did something a bit underhand at work to get a promotion, you know, took credit for something that really wasn't their thing. And this is a prime example of alignment and this idea that we can't hide from ourselves. You know, yes, they got the promotion, but in, you know, the late hours when you're lying in bed, you can't escape from what you did. You know what you did, you know, that's not that, pe that person was not acting in accordance with their values. So they understand now, oh, I was weakening my alignment leg. That's why I felt less happy afterwards, despite on the outside getting a promotion and a pay rise. So I think it's very helpful. I think it works for people across all sections of society, no matter what uh, job they're in, no matter really their socioeconomic status. Like I, I, 
I understand that socioeconomic status matters. I understand that money does play a role here. But, you know, just to sort of finish that thought about money, I don't think money brings happiness in and of itself. I think what money does do is remove common sources of unhappiness. And uh, I've worked for many years in, you know, uh, well, there was one practice in particular in the center of Oldham in the north of England, very, very deprived area. Um, many of my patients there were immigrant families on benefits, a lot of single parents. And I, I see how that was affecting their health, right? But I still maintain that all the things I write about in my previous books and in this book, I was using with those patients because even though I couldn't change necessarily um, a lot of the struggle in their life, I was able to help them with, with simple tools that empower them to, to better show up to face those problems, to make better decisions in the face of that adversity. So I'm very, very passionate that good health information, good health advice should be accessible to all. And I think, I think wellness sometimes gets a, um, a bad reputation for being like a middle-class pursuit. Um, and I've always fought hard against that because I understand where that comes from. But all the advice I try to give in my podcasts and my books, I try my best to make it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And it's a very intentional effort to do that because I, I do feel very passionate about trying to share, share information that everyone's going to find useful. Uh, but of course, I'm not saying that money and social status doesn't play a role. I do understand that that can make it harder for some people to make those choices. So what, what was a personal experience that you had where that shifted the idea of success and happiness, the, the myth that one leads to the other shifted for you and you kind of went in on this other direction of um, it's, it's got to be something different than just money or titles or labels. Yeah. And, you know, was there this one um, kind of seminal moment where I suddenly woke up the next day and thought, oh, I get it now. No. It was subtle shifts, um, you know, day after day, bit by bit. You know, as I answer that, um, and I'm drawn to the conversations we've had on my show in the, in the past light, and um, obviously, you know, you're a meditation teacher. And for me, one of the benefits of meditation and I appreciate I'm talking to a meditation teacher here. So this is um, me sharing my experience rather than trying to say what meditation does or doesn't do. But in my experience, one of the benefits of meditation or frankly, any practice of intentional solitude is that you allow your innermost thoughts and feelings to come up to the surface where you can then deal with them and process them and sit with them. And I think many people, and um, probably would include myself, in this category in the past, was so busy doing stuff like, you know, yeah, productive stuff, stuff that helps people, but doing, doing, or consuming things all the time, that even good stuff, consuming good podcasts, consuming good audio books, whatever it might be, if there's constant incoming coming in from the outside to your body, you're never, you know, really being in touch with how you're truly feeling, with how your body's experiencing what's actually going on. And you know, I've said before, and I'll say it again, that one of my big, one of my most important practices that I do every day is my morning routine. And essentially, it is a practice of solitude where it allows me to really understand how I'm feeling. And I write about it in, in the book about it's almost like taking a daily holiday, right? That um, I, I remember really well, like that um, one of my buddies, uh, he used to work in a factory and he told me that actually his boss would literally have a counter on his desk with, uh, and it would count down and, he would, and people would come in in the morning. He would say, oh, only 66 days till I'm on a beach in Florida. Only 65 days, guys, till I'm on a beach in Florida. And that story has never left me because I thought that's really interesting. People are living their lives, counting down the days for that mythical one week where 
life's going to be wonderful on a beach, right? And it made me really question, you know, what is a holiday? You know, well, it can be many things, right? For many people here in the UK, they go on holiday for sun, for better weather. Uh, it can be, you know, not working, all kinds of things, seeing your family. But I think one of the big things people get on a holiday is perspective, right? If you're flying somewhere, even as the plane's taking off, you suddenly start to get this 30,000 foot view on your life. Those small things that you were bothered about suddenly get put into this larger context. And I think that's what we need every day. We need a period of time where we take a holiday from our lives, when we step outside our lives to gain perspective. Now, you might do that with meditation, for example. Many of your clients may do that with meditation. I often do that with meditation. It could be a walk. It could be um, a walk or a run with no earbuds in, where you're just literally switching off. It could be a cup of coffee where you're not looking at the news. It could be, you know, could be anything, whatever that is for you. But I see it as what you call, what I would call an early warning system. So when I was a junior doctor, like I remember so well, it was back when I was in Edinburgh, I remember being taught, maybe my second year since qualifying, right guys, listen, if we do certain things and we check certain parameters in the patient every hour, we can predict who is going to need a high dependency bed or an intensive care bed a few hours later. And so by predicting that, we can then take aversive action to stop that happening. I thought, isn't that so cool? We can stop people by understanding when they're going in a certain direction, we can get involved and change the trajectory. I see a daily practice of solitude as the same thing. It's an early warning system for ourselves. It's a way of us starting to tap into when we're going off track, when we're starting to... Uh, make the wrong choices, overwork, experience tension in our body, the sort of things that we don't realize when we're constantly consuming. And, you know, I've realized, for example, when I've got too much on light, I start to feel this real tightness in my upper right back. Now, I've probably had that for years. I never knew. But now, with this intentional awareness or a body scan or whatever, it's like, oh, oh, you're starting to get that tightness again. And it may, it's my early warning system. So it helps me sort of go, oh, okay, what's going on? Yeah, you're working a bit too hard at the moment. Do you need to prioritize an early night? Do you need to say no to a few commitments? So this is quite a long-winded answer to your question, but essentially, I think it is this, you know, I mentioned after my dad died that I would go for walks a lot in all this spare time I had. I wouldn't listen to anything. I would just walk and I would think. And with all that space, things start to come up for me things that had, I'd probably buried for years, right? And so a few personal moments that came up, you know, look, I'm, I'm in the public eye, certainly here in the UK in quite a big way. Um, you know, in 2015, I had my own primetime uh, BBC One series called Doctor in the House, which ran uh, for, for a few seasons. And, you know, these were one hour shows where I would go into families' lives. I'd help these families over the course of six weeks and it was shown on primetime television, which has gone out to 70 countries around the world, right? So being in the public eye these days in the world of social media, it makes you learn some lessons pretty quickly because if you don't learn and sort out your inner world and your innermost emotions, it can destroy you pretty quickly. And I used to get very up and down, like uh, positive comments would make me feel good. Negative comments would make me feel literally worthless. I remember when that first series came out and I'd helped this family, this lady who had been in chronic pain for over 10 years um, and had been under doctors and specialists. And I, I managed to help her get pain free within six weeks. I thought this is just incredible to be able to show this to 5 million people a week. And, you know, 99% of the tweets were positive, but, you know, 1% were you know, very attacking. What are you doing? Well, you know, this is not real medicine, whatever. You know, man, I didn't sleep for about a week. It really, really bothered me because I can now look back and go, I wasn't really secure in who I was. I've learned that when you're truly secure in who you are, the negative comments don't bring you right down. And the positive comments don't artificially elevate your ego either. You just stay a lot more constant, a lot more balanced, right? So, I think being in the public eye has helped me learn 
a lot of these lessons fast because you know i'm someone who society would consider very successful lights right i'm a medical doctor i have just published my fifth sunday times bestseller right i have a a podcast that millions listen to every month right like i've ticked off those boxes of societal success but the truth is until very recently i don't think i was really content like i thought the answers to feel good were out there with external validation and doing things and you know this is this is a this is an example that i i'm just not sure how relatable it is to people but you asked me for a personal experience right i love my work i love that what i do gets to help people and but it would be it would be naive to think it hasn't done something for me as well right so when my very first book the four pillar plan in the uk or how to make disease disappear in the us same book when it came out 5 years ago and it got to number 1 in all books on amazon in the uk my buddy is from university in our whatsapp group and me were going nuts we were so excited we're like oh my god this is amazing it's the number one book in the country right and that felt great and yes it was great that i was sharing this message it was going to help people but you know there was a part of me that was also there was that external validation oh man yeah brilliant this is cool this is really good i'm glad it's doing so well right next year after the second book the stress solution comes out again gets to number 1 in all books on amazon and um yeah it felt good it didn't feel quite as good right but it, but it still felt good and my mates were texting me as i say this i even don't know if this is relatable or not but you you can tell me afterwards like third book comes out feel better in five same thing happens right but it took a few days to get there and i'm starting to think oh man is it going to do it again oh man is it you know i know this is a good book oh man yeah great got there in the end yeah so you're not feeling much. You're like, okay, it's more, it's more like a bit of a relief rather than actual joy and contentment. Fourth book last year, again, it gets there. I am just relieved now that it's actually met this new bar that I've set for myself where frankly, 10 years ago, if you told me I'd ever write a book that got in the top of thousand on Amazon, I think I'd be, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd bite your hand off. And it really interestingly, that whole process has helped me you know, it's a small thing, but it's it's more inputs into my system where I go, man, this stuff is just, it's not real. It's just a story. These ratings come and they go. Like, they don't mean what you think they're going to mean when you get there. You know, you still need to feed the kids afterwards. Still need to put the washing on, right? I, I, I don't know if it's the best example, but for me, it's been really, really real to the point where lights you know, we're recording this conversation a month after the UK book has come out, right? Now, a few weeks before the book came out, I remember chatting to one of my friends and they said, oh, you must be, you know, really excited. You know, must be hoping the book does really well. I've got to tell you, like, and this is what I said to him. I said, you know what, mate? Honestly, I really feel I'm in a place where I don't need this book to be a success now to make me feel good about myself right? I know this is a great book. I said that with zero arrogance. I know this is a great book. It's going to help people. This is the best that I can do at this moment in my life. Whether anyone buys this book or not doesn't say anything about who I am, doesn't say anything about the quality of this book. I really felt I'd got to the place where I had let go of the need for the outcome of this book to be certain, to be something, right? And, and am I telling myself a story here? I don't think so. I genuinely think I've got to the point where I let go. And I thought, no, let's put it out there. It will be what it will be. If people like it and they share it, great. If they don't, okay, cool. It's still a great book. And, you know, as it would happen, I think there's a universal lesson here. <laughs> I've never had a book that's been more successful, right? It goes straight to the top of the number one Sunday Times paperback charts. It stays there for the first three weeks. But here's the other truth. Like when my publisher phoned me, right, mm -hmm. the book had been out. I got a text message from my editor saying, hey, could you call when you get a moment? I thought this is, this is, um, this is uh, unusual. I, I had no idea what it was. So I, yeah, I phoned her. 
said, wrong and look, I've just got great news for you. Just found out you're going to be the number one paperback in the country on the Sunday Times list this weekend. Congratulations. And you could hear she was really, really excited. Honestly, lights, I didn't feel much. I honestly didn't feel much. Like, it was just nice to hear. But my daughter had to go to netball practice 20 minutes later, and I had to go and get her clothes ready. And I, 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 it, it was a real life experience that taught me, man, you have changed. You really have changed. This is not you trying to be something or trying to live a certain way. In that moment where I got the kind of news that I think most authors would give you their arm for or think they would give you their arm for, I didn't feel much. It, it wasn't that I felt low. I didn't. I, I, there was a quiet contentment. I, it was genuinely a kind of, oh, I'm so happy that it, it, I, it, it was different from before, right? It had a different flavor. You know, we didn't even celebrate. And maybe you could say I've gone the other way now, but these things, honestly, they just don't mean that much to me anymore. Now, you could say, well, that's okay for you, buddy. You've had this degree of success now, right? So you can chill out about it now because you've had that validation. Yeah, sure. I think there's an element of truth to that. Yeah, I can do. Um, but what I hope to do by sharing stories like this or sharing the book is, you know, I hope to share with people that actually, you know, your dreams won't always make you happy. There's a section of the book where I say your dreams won't make you happy. It Time and time again, if we chase the wrong dreams, we find that they won't make us happy. And, you know, the amount of times I've spoken to people on my podcast, I'm sure you have as well, like where people, they, they get their dreams, but there's still that hole in their heart underneath, you know? And, and for me, I'm very, very proud of my work. I, I'm delighted that it helps so many people. But honestly, I really am at that point now. Look, I'm 44. I've been through a lot in my life, like many people, but I really feel I've never been this happy, this content, this calm inside. And it feels really, really good. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, look, you wrote a book called Happy Mind, Happy Life. So the medium is the message. And as I say in the streets, you're getting high on your own supply. <laughs> you, can't, you can't spend the amount of time that you have to write a book thinking about this stuff. And it's not like you just started thinking about it either, right? You've been thinking about it since you were taking care of your dad every day for years going in. And you had that image juxtaposed with his idea of success. And that that became crystal clear, I imagine, over that process that this is not where it's at. It's got to be somewhere else. And you're taking these long walks and you're you're focused on just helping people, you know, this is your fifth book. And, and I, I noticed that when you were writing those other four books, they all were published in December, one year after the, after the next, you know, December, 2017, December, 2018, 19, you're a busy guy, right? You have a podcast, you have a practice, your TV show. You have to be very scheduled to get that kind of book. Yeah production <laughs> done, which means you have to restrict yourself. And, and I would say just from my experience, because look, I've been meditating for 20 years and I still yeah. feel some kind of way about a negative comment that I may see, but I just have to kind of tell myself, I'm just not going to let it, I'm just not going to engage at all. You know, it's almost like my own restriction for myself is People can write or think whatever they want to think. Yes, I believe in my message. Yes, I believe that I'm that what I'm saying can help somebody out there. And 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 you have to have these like really strict rules with how you're like, I'm gonna take this hour in the morning to do this routine. I'm gonna spend quality time with the kids. I'm going to spend a date night with my wife. Talk a little bit about that. What kind of restrictions do you have in your own personal life that allow you to to have this this mindset and, and the insights that you have and, and allow you to feel that sense of contentness and alignment yeah. and um and control the things that you can't control in your life. Yeah, yeah. So for me, certainly my family is a huge part of this. Um I, I know it doesn't have to be for everyone, right? But for me, I'm, you know, 14 years married, got two kids who I adore. And yeah, I, I put out a lot of content regularly. And so 
I am very structured in some aspects. And I help look after my mum, who's pretty immobile these days with my brother, right? So it does seem quite a lot on the outside. But you know, what are the restrictions? Well, I mean, I don't watch TV, right? I don't, I'm the guy who doesn't know any celebrity, any film, the latest gossip. I mean, I don't watch the news. I don't watch TV, right? So, and I, I'm not saying that that's been a great sacrifice to me. It's just as part of the life that nourishes me that just doesn't fit in. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.